در سال 1844 میلادی حضرت باب رسالت روحانی خیش را به جوانی موسوم به ملا حسین یعنی نخستین فرد In 1844 the Bab declared his mission to a young man named Mulla Hussein the first to believe in him saying O thou who art the first to believe in me verily I say I am the Bab the gate of God Eighteen souls must, in the beginning, spontaneously and of their own accord, accept me and recognize the truth of my revelation. Unwarned and uninvited, each of these souls must seek independently to find me. And when their number is complete, one of them must needs be chosen to accompany me on my pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. There I shall deliver the message of God to the Sharif of Mecca. Mulla Hussein was born in 1813, before the birth of the Bab or Baha'u'llah, in the small Persian town of Bushroyeh. The son of a wealthy dyer, he was given the name Muhammad Hussein. From an early age, the child showed a profound interest in religious and spiritual matters. After completing his studies in the Maktab, the primary school, he was accepted into a religious seminary, a kind of university at which both professors and students lived. Throughout Persia at this time, there was much speculation about the imminent return of the promised Qaim. Seers and sages throughout the country worked to prepare the people for that great day when the Promised One would appear. But like the Jews in the time of Jesus, most believed their Messiah would come as a king to kill their enemies in battle and conquer other nations. Many people learned to use a sword so they could join the army of the Promised One. To unravel this mystery and discover its spiritual purpose, Mullah Hussein turned to a spiritual leader named Sayyid Kazim. Sixteen years earlier, like Mullah Hussein, Sayyid Kazim had left home to enter the presence of another wise man, Sheikh Ahmad, whose followers became known as Sheikhis. Sheikh Ahmad clearly foresaw the pattern of prophetic fulfillment that was soon to be manifested in the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Shoghi Effendi referred to Sheikh Ahmad as that luminous star of divine guidance who had so clearly perceived the approaching glory of Baha'u'llah and laid stress upon the twin revelations which are to follow each other in rapid succession. When Mullah Hussein was only four years old, Sheikh Ahmad traveled from his home in Iraq to the Persian cities of Shiraz and Tehran. While in Shiraz, he publicly extolled the city in astonishing terms by saying, Ere long, the secret of my words will be made manifest to you. Among you shall be some who will live to behold the glory of the day which the prophets of old have yearned to witness. After his visit to Shiraz, the Sheikh traveled to Tehran and was there when an infant was born. Sheikh Ahmad learned of this birth, and like the wise men of the Bible who followed the star to the infant Jesus, he recognized in its full measure the meaning of this auspicious event. He yearned to spend the remaining days of his life within the precincts of the court of this newborn king. The infant would grow up and take the name Baha'u'llah, but the Sheikh would never meet him. In 1819, two years after the infant's birth, Sheikh Ahmad suffered the loss of his own son. He gave his disciples these words of comfort. Grieve not, O oh my friends, for I have offered up my son, my own Ali, as a sacrifice for the Ali whose advent we all await. It took only a few months for the Sheikh's sacrifice to be rewarded. In October of that year, the Bab was born in Shiraz, just as the Sheikh had foretold. Of the Sheikh's disciples, one clearly stood out. This was Sayyid Kazim the master to whom Mullah Hussein would turn for guidance. After the death of his father, Mullah Hussein decided to move to Karbala in Iraq, where Sayyid Kazim, despite fierce opposition, 
taught his followers. Hussein's entire family chose to go with him. While preparing to leave for Karbala, Mullah Hussein had a dream. In this dream, he was in the presence of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, who looked at him gently. Muhammad called him to approach, and then took Hussein in his arms like a kind father. The Prophet put his lips over those of Mullah Hussein and poured a little saliva into his mouth. Suddenly, Hussein felt that his mouth was filled with it. It began to flow out as if a great ocean had burst forth from his mouth, filling all the world. Perplexed, he consulted his relatives, who felt that the dream was surely a sign of great knowledge and attainment in life, and that he would fill the world with his words of wisdom. They were partly right, for Mullah Hussein would become an instrument for propagating wisdom. But, as in the dream, the wisdom he spread would come from another source. Sheikh Ahmad and Sayyid Kazim guarded a fabulous secret, their understanding that two manifestations of God had already been born. They chose to share this secret with only a few of their disciples. Mullah Hussein became one of that trusted circle and began preparing himself for the greatest event not only in his life, but also in the life of mankind. The Declaration of a new manifestation of God. Sayyid Kazim's confidence in Mullah Hussein soared. Before long, he asked Hussein to answer the questions put to him by his students. He so praised Mullah Hussein that many of his followers began to believe that Mullah Hussein must himself be the promised one, a belief that Hussein emphatically denied. During his studies in Karbala, Mullah Hussein twice saw a young man, a merchant from Shiraz, who would later declare himself to be the Bab, the Promised One, the one for whom Mullah Hussein would spend years searching. The first occasion was during a meeting at which Mullah Hussein passionately related the story of the martyred Imam Hussein. It was customary that a sermon never be interrupted. Suddenly, however, the young merchant from Shiraz entered the room. Sayyid Kazim immediately sprung to his feet and offered the place of honor to the new guest, who declined, preferring to sit by the door. This gesture by the master stunned everyone, including Mullah Hussein, who remained speechless until Sayyid Kazim suggested that he read some poetry. Eidel. ز جان گذر کن تا جان جان ببینی بگذار این جهان را تا آن جهان ببینی تا نگذری ز دنیا هرگز رسیب اقبا آزاد شو از اینجا تا بی گمان ببینی گر تو نشان بجویی ایا او هارت لک گو اف یور سول until you see the soul maker leave behind this deceptive faker so you reach your real goal unless you pass through here you will never reach the beyond free yourself from worldly bond doubtless clear to you appear if it is a sign that you seek in this path my dear friend yourself you must transcend and signs to you will speak. On another occasion, during a discourse by Sayyid Kazim, Mullah Hussein noticed a young man quietly enter the room and take a seat near the threshold, listening intently. As Kazim at last noticed the youth, he stopped talking. 
One of his disciples begged him to continue, but instead of resuming his lecture, he turned toward the Bab, who was seated in a shaft of light, and replied, What more shall I say? Lo, the truth is more manifest than the ray of light that has fallen upon that lamp. Kazim actually pointed to that ray of light, that lap of the Bab, who as yet undeclared was seated among them. Yet none in the room comprehended its meaning. As if to prove this, someone in the audience asked, Why is it that you neither reveal his name nor identify his person? Sayyid Kazim replied by pointing with his finger to his own throat implying that if he were to divulge the name of the Promised One, they both would be put to death. The revolutionary ideas of the Sheikhis attracted increasing controversy and outright persecution. Some mullahs banned them, labeling them heretics and infidels. When they spoke in public, mobs would often attack them. In the city of Isfahan, violence reached a critical point. To solve this dilemma, Sayyid Kazim outlined a difficult but urgent mission. Someone must travel to Isfahan, rebuke a powerful cleric, and cause him to declare the authority of Sheikh Ahmad. One of the older and more experienced disciples volunteered, but Kazim rejected the offer, saying, Beware of touching the lion's tail. Belittle not the delicacy and difficulty of such a mission. Following this, there was a silence among the disciples. At last, Sayyid Kazim turned to Mullah Hussein and said, Arise and perform this mission, and I declare you equal to the task. The Almighty will graciously assist you and crown your endeavors with success. Mullah Hussein sprang to his feet. A thousand miles of hard road and difficult mountains lay between Karbala and Isfahan. His tireless mission would take two years. And so it was that after a long and exhausting journey, Mola Hussein finally reached the walls of Isfahan, the domain of a learned and wealthy Mujtahed, doctor of religion, called Haji Sayyid Muhammad Bagher. Disheveled and travel-stained, wearing a long white robe that came to his feet, 30-year-old Mola Hussein entered the city and went directly to the place where Muhammad Bagher and his students were meeting in luxurious surroundings. After entering the city, Mola Hussein had not stopped to eat or rest, so intent was he on fulfilling his mission. As the powerful Mujtahed turned to him, somewhat startled at the intrusion of this insignificant figure, Hussein summoned to his aid all the courage and confidence that Sayyid Kazim had inspired in him. He began with these words. Hearken, O Sayyid, to my words, for response to my plea will ensure the safety of the faith of the Prophet of God, and refusal to consider my message will cause a grievous injury. The richly apparelled assembly grew surly and began to hurl insults at the intruder. But the great Mujtahed grew quiet and began to listen to the man's message. Muhammad Bagher apologized for the behavior of his followers. This strange and considerate behavior caused great consternation among his followers. Once a believer in the Sheikhi message, the Mujtahed confessed that he now had grown confused by the mysterious 
and obscure allusions in the writings of the movement's leaders, and so had chosen to grow silent in his support. Surrounded by this eminent cleric's disciples, Mullah Hussein replied with a dagger-like thrust of words. I cannot but deplore such silence on your part, for I firmly believe that it involves the loss of a splendid opportunity to advance the cause of truth. Mullah Hussein offered to clarify for this most learned man the true meaning of any shaky writings that seemed mysterious or inconsistent with the faith. Moved by Mullah Hussein's sincerity and perseverance, Muhammad Bagher accepted the offer. For the remainder of the day, he and Mullah Hussein, surrounded by a gallery of onlookers, discussed and debated. The Mujtahid's faithful disciples watched their master lose argument after argument to this youth. Finally, he promised to issue a written declaration testifying to the high station of the two great teachers that Mullah Hussein had come to defend. About Mullah Hussein, this powerful cleric said, Such is the strength with which this youth seems to be endowed, that if he were able to declare the day to be night, I would still believe him able to deduce such proofs as would conclusively demonstrate in the eyes of the learned divines the truth of his statement. Sayyid Kazim received the news of Mullah Hussein's success with great joy, but the great teacher passed away before Mullah Hussein returned to Karbala. His followers turned to Mullah Hussein as a source of guidance and some of them even began to believe that he was the Qayyim spoken of by their teacher, a belief that Mullah Hussein flatly denied. Mullah Hussein's devotion to the path of God and his single-mindedness in searching for the Promised One was evident in his daily prayers and long periods of fasting. Now, separation from his teacher, Sayyid Kazim, forced Mullah Hussein to trust solely in God with an unquenchable thirst for his love and that of the Beloved. The poet Rumi expresses this well when he writes, Pay heed to the grievances of the reed, of what divisive separations breed. From the reed bed cut away just like a weed. My music people curse, warn and heed. Slice to pieces, my bosom and heart bleed, while I tell this tale of desire and need. Whoever fell away from the source will seek and toil until return to course. Of grievances I sing to every crowd, befriended both the humble and the proud. Bishnu Azne Chun Hekal Yatmi Konat. از جدایی ها شکایت می کند که از نیستان تا مرا ببریده اند از نفیرم مرد و زن نالیدند سینه خواهم شرح شرح از فراغ تا بگویم شرح درد اشتیاق هر کسی کو دور مند از اصل خیش باز جوید روزگار وصل خیش من به هر جمعیتی نالان شدم جفت بدحالان و خوشحالان شدم Before his death, the last wish expressed by Mullah Hussein's teacher, Sayyid Kazim, was that his followers would leave their homes, scatter far and wide, purge their hearts from every idle fancy, and dedicate themselves to search for the Promised One. After 40 days of fasting and prayer in preparation for his own quest, a woman approached Mullah Hussein to interpret a dream. She said, I saw that I was in a place where a number of people were saying that ere long the sun will rise from the direction of the city of Shiraz. 
Mullah Hussein knew the meaning of this dream. He set out for Shiraz, accompanied by his brother and nephew. After a long journey, they arrived at the entrance to Shiraz, called the Gate of Kazerun. It was the afternoon of May 22, 1844. His companions left to find lodging, and shortly after, a youth approached him, inviting him to his home. Mullah Hussein described the youth in these words. I was profoundly impressed by the gentle yet compelling manner in which that strange youth spoke to me. As I followed him, his gait, the charm of his voice, the dignity of his bearing served to enhance my first impressions of this unexpected meeting. The youth offered refreshments, and it now being the time for evening prayer, the two of them performed ablutions. Mullah Hussein spoke this prayer. I have striven with all my soul, O oh my God, and until now have failed to find thy promised messenger. I testify that thy word faileth not, and that thy promise is sure. The youth asked Mullah Hussein if his teacher had given any detailed characteristics of the promised one for whom he sought. Hussein replied, Yes, he is of a pure lineage, is of illustrious descent, and of the seed of Fatima. As to his age, he is more than twenty and less than thirty. He is endowed with innate knowledge. He is of medium height, abstained from smoking, and is free from bodily deficiency. The youth paused. It was exactly two hours and eleven minutes past sunset when he declared, Behold, all these signs are manifest in me. He went on to demonstrate that he possessed all of the characteristics described by Sayyid Kazim. But Mullah Hussein felt compelled to test the veracity of this claim. Sayyid Kazim had told him that when found, the Promised One, unasked, would reveal a commentary that would interpret and clarify the mysterious Surah of Joseph. This Surah, or chapter of the Quran, relates the biblical story of Jacob's son Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, but eventually was elevated by Pharaoh to rule over Egypt. It is said that Muhammad had revealed this surah in response to a challenge in order to prove the truth of his mission. The many mysteries and perplexities of the surah of Joseph eluded even the most scholarly religious leaders. This explains the astonishment that Mullah Hussein must have felt when, in the middle of their conversation, the Bab suddenly said, Now is the time to reveal the commentary on the surah of Joseph. The Bab spontaneously wrote and narrated the first chapter of his commentary on Joseph. The words flowed from him effortlessly, like a gentle stream of water, without any hesitation or interruption, as if wholly realized at once and just now unveiled in perfect form. Astonished, Hussein realized that the object of his search had been found and he felt ashamed at having doubted and tested the Promised One. As dawn approached on that eventful morning in 1844, the Bab secretly revealed to Mullah Hussein his mission to be the Bab, or Gate, through whom another manifestation of God would become known. Mullah Hussein found himself enraptured by his young host. He exclaimed, I sat spellbound by his utterance, oblivious of time and of those who awaited me. This revelation, so suddenly and impetuously thrust upon me, came as a thunderbolt, which for a time seemed to have benumbed my faculties. I was blinded by its dazzling splendor 
and overwhelmed by its crushing force. Excitement, joy, awe, and wonder stirred the depths of my soul. Predominant among these emotions was a sense of gladness and strength which seemed to have transfigured me. The knowledge of his revelation had galvanized my being. I felt possessed of such courage and power that were the world and all its peoples and its potentates to rise against me, I would, alone and undaunted, withstand their onslaught. The universe seemed but a handful of dust in my grasp. I seemed to be the voice of Gabriel personified, calling unto all mankind, Awake, for lo, the morning light has broken. Arise, for his cause is made manifest. The portal of his grace is open wide. Enter therein, O peoples of the world, for he who is your promised one is come. In the moments before dawn, Mullah Hussein became the first disciple of the Bab, the only person to whom this revolutionary declaration had been made, the first of 18 letters of the living, as the Bab would call his earliest followers. In brief, I hold within my grasp whatsoever any man might wish of the good of this world and of the next. Were I to remove the veil, all would recognize me as their best beloved, and no one would deny me. Over the next few years, the Bab and his followers revealed his true station gradually so that his mission would have time to be fulfilled. By referring to himself as the Bab, or Gate of God, he used a term that was familiar to Muslims of that time. There had been others who were known as Babs, or intermediaries, between Muslims and the hidden Imam who was the last hereditary successor of the Prophet Muhammad. It was believed that the hidden Imam who disappeared in the 9th century was still in hiding. Many Muslims believed that the Bab, because of his title, was merely claiming to be another such intermediary, a claim that would have seemed audacious, but perhaps tolerable. The Bab's secrecy echoed the efforts of Christ to keep his identity and mission secret until the right time. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Despite the Bob's plan for secrecy about his true station, an irate clergy one day summoned the Bob to a mosque and pressured him to renounce any claim of being the Qaim. In the words of Abdu'l-Bahá, he discoursed from the pulpit in such wise as to silence and subdue those present and to establish and strengthen his followers. It was then supposed that he claimed to be the medium of grace from his highness the Lord of the age, upon him be peace. But afterwards it became known and evident that his meaning was the gatehood of another city and the mediumship of the graces of another person whose qualities and attributes were contained in his books and treatises. The Bab knew that most people were only ready to hear the message of his gatehood. By allowing this true but incomplete belief, he gained time for his mission to unfold. Christ as well had refused to either deny or agree with his accusers. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is taken before Pilate. Pilate went back into the palace and called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? he asked him. 
Jesus answered, Does this question come from you, or have others told you about me? Pilate asked him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In mirroring Christ's behavior, the Bab fulfilled a traditional Islamic prophecy that says, the Promised One will share characteristics of four of the prophets of the past. The fear of Moses, the destruction of idols of Muhammad, the imprisonment of Joseph, and the patience and denial of Christ. Early in the unfolding of his cause, the Bab rewarded Mullah Hussein with an incredible mission to secretly deliver a message to an unidentified person in Tehran. The implication was abundantly clear. This person, this mystery in Tehran, could only be the manifestation of God prophesied by the Bab as him who will be made manifest. Throughout sacred literature are references to twin manifestations, the appearance of two manifestations of God in rapid succession. In the Bible, St. John referred to these successive revelations by clearly prophesying, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Abdu'l-Baha explained this reference when he wrote, this third woe is the day of the manifestation of Baha'u'llah, the day of God, and it is near to the day of the appearance of the Bab. The essential fact is that all are promised two manifestations who will come one following on the other. In his writings, Sheikh Ahmad, who had so clearly perceived the approaching glory of Baha'u'llah, used these words. The twin revelations follow each other in rapid succession. The mystery of this cause must needs be made manifest, and the secret of this message must needs be divulged. I can say no more. After a long journey with stops in many cities along the way, Mullah Hussein finally arrived in Tehran and took up lodging in the local seminary. He pondered how to find the unnamed recipient of the Bob's message and how to deliver it without detection. One day, a seminary student overheard Mullah Hussein's conversation with an instructor about these matters. The student, known as Mo'alem, approached Mullah Hussein and explained that he knew a person who satisfied all the conditions that had been described. The next day, Mu'alem delivered a message from Mullah Hussein to that person, Mirza Hussein Ali Anuri, who one day would take the name Baha'u'llah. Mu'alem returned to Mullah Hussein with a gift, a loaf of Russian sugar and a package of tea, along with an expression of appreciation and love. Baha'u'llah later revealed a tablet which said, امروز از این است چه که در جمیع کتب یوم الله معروف جمیع انبیاء و اصفیاء طالب لقای این یوم بدی بودن و همچنین احزاب مختلفه ارز و چون آفتاب ظهور از سماع مشیت الهی اشراق نمود کل منسعق و مدهوش مشاهد گشتند Great indeed is this day, the allusions made to it in all the sacred scriptures as the day of God 
attest its greatness. The soul of every prophet of God, of every divine messenger, hath thirsted for this wondrous day. All the diverse kindreds of the earth have likewise yearned to attain it. No sooner, however, had the day star of his revelation manifested itself in the heaven of God's will, then all, except those whom the Almighty was pleased to guide, were found dumbfounded and heedless. Many years before, as an infant born in Tehran, Mirza Hussein Ali had been recognized by Sheikh Ahmad. Within a few years of receiving the message from the Bab, Mirza Hussein Ali would take the name Baha'u'llah, but for some time would keep his true station a secret. During this time, only three people would know that Baha'u'llah was the manifestation of God prophesied by the Bab. These people were Mullah Hussein, Godus, and Tahereh. Mullah Hussein received Baha'u'llah's gift with great emotion. He kissed it and pressed it upon his forehead, and then warned Mu'alem, the messenger. Let this be a secret hidden within your breast. Divulge not his name, for they who envy his position will arise to harm him. On this trip, Mullah Hussein did not meet Baha'u'llah though his heart was crying out to gain his presence. During the months following Mullah Hussein's mission to Tehran, persecution of the Bab's followers grew into armed conflict. In Shiraz, enemies of the Bab had isolated him and forbidden that he make any contact with his followers. Impatient to see his beloved, Mullah Hussein went immediately to Shiraz, but the Bab sent him instructions to escape the danger in that city and travel to the province of Khorasan by way of Yazd. Mullah Hussein obediently began the long journey through deserts and other inhospitable regions, spreading the message of the Bab along the way. He and his companions made their way from Shiraz to Yazd, Tabas, and then to his boyhood home of Boshruye. They at last ended their journey in Mashhad. But the situation in Mashhad was tense. The son of the governor of Khorasan, who went by the name of Salar, was openly rebelling against the central government. Salar and his men had defeated the king's army, which had been sent to put down the rebellion. And now Salar wished to recruit the Babis to aid his cause. He sought a meeting with Mullah Hussein, whom he recognized as their leader in the region. Knowing that there was no hope of convincing Salar of the spiritual nature of the Babi cause, Mullah Hussein chose instead to make a pilgrimage on foot to see the Bab who had been banished to the prison of Maku in the remote mountainous regions of Azerbaijan. This would be a tremendous journey. Mullah Hussein intended to go alone but was persuaded to let Gambar Ali, his faithful attendant, accompany him. This journey would be of unimagined value to Mullah Hussein. He would end up visiting two manifestations of God on one journey. In Tehran, Mullah Hussein met secretly with Baha'u'llah and finally was able to behold the countenance of the Blessed Beauty. After hundreds of miles of walking, Mullah Hussein and his companion finally arrived at the prison in the most remote part of Azerbaijan. The governor of the fortress, 
Ali Khan, had been completely won over by the Bab. Ali Khan followed Mullah Hussein to the gate of the castle fortress. As Mullah Hussein looked up, there, standing at the threshold of the gate, was his beloved. They embraced, and the Bab led Mullah Hussein to his chamber. In one of the Bab's tablets, we find these words. Mandarin Ulama Madam Tau Azamat Vajalol Shahodat Rau Mushaw Hadekunad Shumal Midoni Manchakad Shahodat Rau و جان فشانی مرا قبول I am come into this world to bear witness to the glory of sacrifice. You are aware of my longing. You realize the degree of my renunciation. Nay, beseech the Lord your God to hasten the hour of my martyrdom. And to accept my sacrifice. Shoma e shohada yera Mahzun maba ushid. Va agar man azin zamin mokadagus. Baro ye anjaum maamuri yatehogud. بموتن خیش می رویم اندوهگین Grieve not therefore if I depart from this land for I am hastening to fulfill my destiny. The nine days and nights they spent together in Maku were immeasurably precious. When the time of Mullah Hussein's departure came, the Bab addressed him with these prophetic words. You have walked on foot all the way from your native province to this place. On foot you must return until you reach your destination, for your days of horsemanship are yet to come. The Bab detailed the path of this journey, asking Mullah Hussein to express his love and tender affection to the believers in those towns. Then he said, From Tehran, you should proceed to Mazandaran, where God's hidden treasure will be made manifest to you. Following his declaration, the Bab was free for only two and a half years. The final five years of his life were spent either in house arrest or in the prisons of Maku and Chirik. Mullah Hussein departed Maku on the ninth day of Nowruz. Only a few days after he left, the Bab was banished to another prison in Cherik. Obedient as always, Mullah Hussein followed the route prescribed by the Bab. When at last he reached Tehran, he once again achieved the presence of Baha'u'llah and gained new spirit to face his coming tests. Mullah Hussein went to the town of Barfurush in the province of Mazandaran. 
This was the home of Qadus, and Mullah Hussein paid a visit to his friend in the company of many other believers. Qadus received him with great respect, washing the dust from his feet and giving him the place of honor at the gathering. Qadus himself sat at the entrance, the lowest place, ready to serve his friend. After the meeting, Mullah Hussein and Qadus were left alone to talk. Mullah Hussein shared the inspiring experiences he had enjoyed in the presence of the Bab and spoke of the mission he had been given to discover a hidden treasure in Mazandaran. Qadus then asked if Mullah Hussein had brought with him any of the Bab's new writings, which he had not. Qadus handed Mullah Hussein some manuscripts and asked him to read them. As he read, Mullah Hussein was astonished. Looking at Qadus, he said, I can well realize that the author of these words has drawn his inspiration from that fountainhead which stands immeasurably superior to the sources whence the learning of men is ordinarily derived. I hereby testify to my wholehearted recognition of the sublimity of these words and to my unquestioned acceptance of the truth which they reveal. Qadus remained silent and Mullah Hussein suddenly realized that his host was the author of these lofty and profound words. He rose from the seat of honor and walked to the threshold of the door, the lowliest place. With bowed head, he reverently spoke to Qadus. The hidden treasure of which the Bab has spoken now lies unveiled before my eyes. Though my master be now hidden amid the mountain fastnesses of Azerbaijan, the sign of his splendor and the revelation of his might stand manifest before me. I have found in Mazandaran the reflection of his glory. The next day, when the believers returned to the house of Qadus, they were surprised to find the 35-year-old Mullah Hussein now standing at the door with bowed head, demonstrating complete humility before Qadus, a youth of 22. As Qadus spoke to the astonished guests, he made it clear that they should proceed to Mashhad in the province of Khorasan and build a house to serve as headquarters for a new and more public teaching effort. To this house, he told the gathering, You shall invite every receptive soul who we hope may be guided to the river of everlasting life. We shall prepare and admonish them to band themselves together and proclaim the cause of God. Mazandaran, Mullah Hussein and Qadus built a house called Babi Yeh, which served as a center of teaching. Mullah Hussein's job was to gather seekers and bring them to Qadus, who in turn taught and deepened the friends who now numbered in the hundreds. By this time in their short history, the Letters of the Living had carried the Bab's message to different parts of the country but had not yet disclosed its true character. They had taught only that a new gate to the hidden Imam had opened. They were not yet permitted even to mention the name of the Bab or disclose his true purpose. But now, in Khorasan, the home province of Mullah Hussein, the time had come to proclaim it. Even though the founder of the faith was in prison, Qadus and Mullah Hussein, two outstanding letters of the living, were at the center of this proclamation. 
the arising of Mullah Hussein was the fulfillment of the prophecy of a Ka'im from Khorasan. The proclamation of the cause of God attracted even more attention. The antagonism of the clerics grew increasingly vicious, and the clerics plotted to draw the government into schemes of persecution. Violence began to erupt. As the numbers of believers grew, the clergy asked Mehdi Kuli Mirza, a prince who had camped outside the city, to assist in the arrest and punishment of Mullah Hussein. As the prince was busy writing a letter to the governor about this matter, his highest ranking officer approached him, saying that if he wished to harm Mullah Hussein, the prince must first kill him. The officer said that he admired and valued Mullah Hussein more than his own life. The prince responded to him by saying that he also deeply respected Mullah Hussein and that his intent was to protect rather than punish. And so the prince wrote a letter to Mullah Hussein inviting him to spend a few days as his guest in a most luxurious tent. Upon receiving it, Mullah Hussein took the invitation to Qadus, who advised him to accept and leave immediately. As Mullah Hussein proceeded to the prince's camp, Qadus and a few others traveled to Badasht. There, Baha'u'llah spent an entire day alone with Qadus and invited him to join many others, including Tahare and himself at the conference of Badasht. After the conference, the believers were each assigned a task and dispersed throughout the country to teach. In July of 1848, while performing his task, Kodus, the last letter of the living, was arrested and imprisoned in Mazandaran. Mullah Hussein received a message from the Bab, who was still in prison in the mountains of Cherik, asking him to proceed immediately to Mazandaran. Mullah Hussein, the first letter of the living, had been commanded to proclaim the Bab's message in Mazandaran, the land of Kodus, the last letter of the living. In the Bab's letter to Mullah Hussein, which was accompanied by his turban, the Bab wrote, Adorn your head with my green turban, the emblem of my lineage, and with the black standard unfurled before you, hasten to the Jazra'i Khadra and lend your assistance to my beloved Khodus. And in another place he writes, O hour of the dawn, ere the resplendent glory of the divine luminary sheddeth its radiance from the day spring of this gate, Call thou to mind that the appointed day of God will indeed be at hand in less than a twinkling of an eye. Thus, the decree of God hath been issued in the Mother Book. The title Sayyid is used only by direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, and only descendants of the Prophet were allowed to wear a green turban. Accompanied by 202 believers, Mullah Hussein set out on his march carrying the black standards, flags of pure black, which are symbols of the promised Qa'in. According to an Islamic prophecy, Should your eyes behold the black standards proceeding from Khorasan, hasten towards them, even should ye have to crawl over snow inasmuch as they proclaim the advent of the promised Mahdi, the Vice-Regent of God. As the band of believers made their way from one village to another, new believers joined them despite the danger of the journey. 
The band was a target for thieves and robbers. Each person had to carry everything they needed, and food was not always available. Twice every day, though, Mola Hussein spoke to his companions, and his words charmed them, becoming their real food and rest. In the old city of Neshapur, once a thriving metropolis, but now just a small town surrounded by an old wall and a ditch, a turquoise merchant named Haji Abdul Majid joined the band of believers. He was the father of Badi, the youth who later became the bearer of Baha'u'llah's tablet to the king of Persia. In the village of Mazinan, a messenger from Kodus caught up with them. He carried a letter in which Kodus gave certain instructions to Mullah Hussein and predicted some future events, including the martyrdom of Mullah Hussein and his companions. In preparation for his martyrdom, Mullah Hussein washed his body, put on new clothing, and led his companions in the noonday prayer. When the Babis arrived in Miyame, Mullah Hussein went directly to the mosque and eloquently proclaimed the cause of God and the march of the black standards from Khorasan. This stirred the hearts of many people. Among them was an old man of 83. Despite his age, he refused to mount a horse, but insisted on running alongside Mullah Hussein all the way to Mazandaran. From Miyane, Mullah Hussein replied to the letter sent by Kodus, expressing his complete submission to the will of God and his desire to give his life for the faith. In the village of Ormiyan, a mullah, accompanied by the owner of the village, protested the Babi's march. After camping under trees outside the village of Shahrud, the Babis travel on to Dehe Mullah. Here, Mullah Hussein received another message from the Bab. More people joined the march. The group was growing so large that Mullah Hussein divided the band into groups of ten, each with its own supervisor. At the village of Chashme Ali, which was on the road from Tehran to Mazandaran, Mullah Hussein halted the march and proclaimed, We stand at the parting of the ways. We shall await God's decree as to which direction we should take. They camped there for a number of days. One day, a great wind broke off a large branch of the tree beneath which they were camped. Mullah Hussein observed the damage, then said, The tree of the sovereignty of Muhammad Shah has by the will of God been uprooted and hurled to the ground. Three days later, a messenger arrived and told him that the king, Muhammad Shah, had died. The next morning they arose and began their march again. Mullah Hussein pointed in the direction of Mazandaran and said, this is the way that leads to our Karbala. Whoever is unprepared for the great trials that lie before us, let him now repair to his home and give up the journey. As they passed through other villages, the hatred of many of the local residents had now been inflamed by the Mullahs, and they had been promised that killing even one follower of the Bab would cancel all their sins. After 83 days, the marchers arrived at the outskirts of Barfurush, one of the most prosperous cities in Persia. Their arrival greatly alarmed the powerful religious leader, Saidul Uloma, a fierce enemy of Kodus. Angry and frightened, he summoned the people of Barfurush to the mosque, where he called for jihad, a holy war against the Babis. Awake, for our enemies stand at our very doors ready to wipe out all that we cherish as pure and holy in Islam. 
Should we fail to resist them, none will be left to survive their onslaught. Tomorrow, at the hour of dawn, let all of you arise and march out to exterminate their forces. And march out they did. The next morning, as Mullah Hussein led his band of believers toward the city, they confronted an armed mob. As some of the friends drew their swords to fight the enemy, Mullah Hussein settled them with these words. Not yet, not until the aggressor forces us to protect ourselves, must our swords leave their scabbards. As he finished speaking, the enemy attacked. Six of his companions were shot and fell to the ground. Still, Mullah Hussein asked for patience, saying, The time has not yet come. The number is incomplete. At last, as one of the oldest and most devout members of the band was shot, Mullah Hussein raised his eyes to heaven and offered this prayer. Behold, O God, my God, the plight of thy chosen companions, and witness the welcome which these people have accorded thy loved ones. Thou hast thyself commanded us to defend our lives against the assaults of the enemy. Faithful to thy command, I now arise with my companions to resist the attack which they have launched against us. Then, unsheathing his sword, he charged into the midst of the frenzied mob and went straight for the murderer of his elderly friend. The assailant hid himself behind a small tree pointing his musket, but Mullah Hussein reached him before he could fire. With a single stroke of his sword, he sliced in half the trunk of the tree, the barrel of the musket, and its holder. Seeing this superhuman feat astonished the enemy, and they fled in panic and confusion. This battle was the beginning of many acts of heroism performed by Mullah Hussein in his final months. During these months, the persecution of the Babis continued to worsen until finally a band of 72 was forced to take refuge at the shrine of Sheikh Tabarsi, who had been a follower of Sheikh Ahmad. The Babis were forced to turn the shrine into a fort for their self-defense. After the Babis defeated one attacking army, a new and larger army laid siege upon them for seven months. Led by Mullah Hussein, these believers endured countless attacks and were often so hungry they ate the leather of their shoes and saddles. Still, they defeated the larger and better equipped enemy in numerous battles. Despite the danger and harsh conditions, more followers of the Bab came to join Mullah Hussein and the others in the fort. With the guidance of Baha'u'llah, Qudus was finally able to gain release from his imprisonment in Mazandaran. Two months into the siege, he joined his friends at the shrine of Sheikh Tabarsi. A few months later, Mullah Hussein performed his final heroic act. On the evening of February 1st, 1849, Mullah Hussein performed his ablutions, dressed in clean clothes, placed on his head the Bob's green turban, and spent the rest of the evening in devotions. Shortly after midnight, he mounted his horse and led a charge of all 313 men against the huge enemy forces. Sword in hand and roaring like a lion, Mullah Hussein attacked the first barricade, breaking through and scattering its defenders. Bullets rained down upon the Babis and many were hit. With great swiftness, Mullah Hussein smashed through the second and third barricades, leaving the enemy in despair. Amazingly, he was untouched. So confused was the enemy that they began firing on themselves in the darkness. 
Suddenly, the army camp exploded in bright flames. Now able to see their opponents, the king's army began a relentless torrent of musket fire of thousands of bullets. Still, the Babis attacked and routed the army in victory. But Mullah Hussein's horse became entangled in the rope of a tent. The army's leader, Abbas Kuli Khan, was hiding in the branches of a tree. Without knowing who was riding the horse, he took aim and fired, striking Mullah Hussein in the chest. Kodus brought his wounded friend back to the fort. In a private room, Kodus and his mortally wounded friend, Mullah Hussein, spoke quietly to each other for about 20 minutes. Finally, Kodus said, You have hastened the hour of your departure and have abandoned me to the mercy of my foes. Please God, I will ere long join you and taste the sweetness of heaven's ineffable delights. Mullah Hussein gently replied, May my life be a ransom for you. Are you well pleased with me? Mullah Hussein died shortly after. A faint smile still lingered on his face. In paying tribute to him, Nabil, a historian of the faith, wrote these words. He was six and thirty years old when he quaffed the cup of martyrdom. At the age of eighteen he made the acquaintance in Karbala of Said Kazin. For nine years he sat at his feet and imbibed the lesson which was destined to prepare him for the acceptance of the message of the Bab. The nine remaining years of his life were spent in the midst of a restless, a feverish activity, which carried him eventually to the field of martyrdom, in circumstances that have shed imperishable luster upon his country's history. In the writings of the Bab we find these words. By my glory, I will make the infidels to taste, with the hands of my power, retribution unknown of anyone except me, and will waft over the faithful those musk-scented breaths, which I have nursed in the midmost heart of my throne. The body of Mullah Hussein was buried on the east corner of the fort, and Kodus was buried on the west corner. While in Baghdad, Baha'u'llah wrote that pilgrimage and circumambulation of this site was one of the most important duties of every Babi. Upon hearing of the martyrdom of his believers, especially those at the shrine of Sheikh Tabarsi, the Bab revealed a number of tablets of visitation for the martyrs. In paying tribute to Mullah Hussein, Baha'u'llah credited Mullah Hussein with this supreme accomplishment. But for him, God would not have been established upon the seat of his mercy, nor ascended the throne of eternal glory.